John Updike is one of the nation's greatest living writers. He has won countless literary awards, including two Pulitzer Prizes, as well as the National Book Award. He is probably best known for his Rabbit Run series, chronicling the life of Harry Angstrom and four decades of contemporary middle-class America. His prolific career has produced over 50 books, including short stories, children's books, poems, essays, and criticism. His current work, Gertrude and Claudius, is his 19th novel. It tells the story of the king and queen of Denmark before and leading into Shakespeare's great masterpiece, Hamlet. I am pleased to have John Updike back at this table. Welcome back. Thank you. Nice you to be you here. were here the last time, and I said, what's next? And you said, I can't really tell you, but... Uh, you sort of hinted it would be involving Denmark. You remember this? I did. Did I? Yeah. I gave it all away. You, well, no, not all of it, but some of it. And I wasn't smart enough at the moment to, to pick it up, what you were doing. Because I, it, the thing that I would never have fathomed is that you were going <laughs> to tell us you know, that you would rip off Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Exactly. Um, and I didn't think you had the mmm to do that. Yeah. You know? Well, or the or innocence. Um, do you want to know well, why I did it? Yes, I mean, well, that's what, a good what, question. What yeah. was going through my mind? Yes. Um, I think for years, ever since I first read the play uh, at college, uh, I thought that we didn't really know enough about Gertrude and Claudius uh, before the play opens. They haven't I, been given their due. Not really, exactly, exactly. No, I thought they were given kind of short shrift and uh, treated as villains when they were just, uh, as far as I could see, a loving couple trying to make the best of the world they were in. And uh, I saw uh, Kenneth Branagh's uh, uncut movie of Uncut Hamlet movie. Uncut? It was, it, it, was, it was done to text. It was about five hours, wasn't it? It was five good hours, though. And you saw it all. <laughs> you saw all those minor characters who are generally cut out and left out. And so, uh, anyway, uh, the Gertrude and Claudius there were vivid enough that that kind of emboldened me to make this little assault upon the sacred castle of William Shakespeare. Now... Uh, did you have trepidation because you knew people could say, what does he think he is? There were a couple of reviews that said, this exactly is not that. as good as Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> well, how does that, that hurts a guy's feelings. Uh, but uh, I, was trying, <laughs> I was trying not so much to compete, but to sup, sup, supplement, to, yeah. to uh, you know, to help, help out, to provide another layer. Uh, now, that then goes to how did you go about sort of deciding how and what you wanted to say about Gertrude and Claudius? Well, I went back and read the original sources of the Hamlet legend, which goes back to the darkness of Viking, Viking Same days. Same sources that, that William that, Shakespeare, that Shakespeare read? Shakespeare used. Well, he only used one. He used a French translation of a Latin text, but I read both translations of the original Latin text done in about the 12th century, and then the French translation done, I think, in the... 16th, and uh, what we're missing is an earlier play. There was an earlier Hamlet play, which is mentioned in the Elizabethan Chronicles, but that we have no text of. So what do we think happened? Just don't know. Uh, we think maybe somebody like Thomas Kidd wrote it and that Shakespeare's company purchased it, because uh, you could do that then, and then handed it to Shakespeare and said, you do the best you can with this this mishmash here. And he started all over. So he did, and he made a beautiful mishmash of yeah. it, but it is a kind of mishmash anyway. Right. Things don't exactly tie together. So when you get down into the text and try to think, well, how long was that, and when did that happen, and what's yeah. the precedent here, you have to make up a lot of a lot of material that he does not provide. Tell me about your Gertrude and Claudius. Well, not the book, but the characters. One loves one loves uh, Gertrude in the play. She just uh, speaks so well. Of course, you could say all Shakespeare characters speak so well. well. It's yes. what they do, after all. <laughs> it's what but he did. She, but she, what he did, his thing. Uh, <laughs> But everything she says is kind of gentle and wise and on the mark, and she doesn't have very many lines. But uh, if I can just read the first six lines, she speaks. Yeah. This is in not this from play. your book, but from. This is from the original. original. William Shakespeare. Uh, uh, I think we all remember the scene dimly. It's the very sulky Hamlet in black, usually uh, gathered with uh, the new king and his newly married queen, and uh, he's in a sulk and making these rude puns. Uh, against poor Claudius, and the queen says, Good Hamlet, cast thy knighted color off, and let thine eye look like a friend on Denmark, that is, King Denmark, uh, king, of, king of... Do not forever with thy veiled lids seek for thy noble father in the dust. And then this is, kills me. Thou knowst tis common, all that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. 
I was not beautiful from a mother to son. Uh, yeah. Your life, in a nutshell, all that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. So anyway, I tried to make her say equally wise and gracious things in the course of my novelization. Now, what do you think she knew? I don't think she knew that her uh, husband had been killed by her, his, his brother. I mean, uh, think so. I think even from within the play, you can guess that. For example, she remains innocent right up to the duel that Hamlet and Laertes have. You know, she drinks the poison cup. If she was in on it, if she was a co-conspirator with Claudia, she wouldn't have made that silly mistake. So I think he, out of his, because he does love her. I mean, that's one thing that emerges in several sections is Claudia says, yeah, I'm just crazy about this woman. I can't help it, but there it is. And so he, uh, he protects her from the knowledge of what he had to do. But in my novel, it's not too much to say, perhaps. In my novel, uh, he kills his brother to protect uh, his lover, the queen, because the king, I'm giving the whole plot away. Nobody need read it now. No, I've come on, no, John. I've no, made no, a no, mess no. of this interview. <laughs> no, uh, no, you haven't. Come on. <laughs> But, no, no, uh, but I mean, this makes it more interesting. Don't you get it? This uh, makes it much more interesting now that we hear you telling us why it does. Right, I'm not yeah. humoring you. I uh, promise. So where was I? <laughs> all right. Oh, you were talking uh, about Claudius. Does it, and yeah, he does it. The king knows. King, king Hamlet figures it out or yeah, is told. Right, right. Both, actually. You know how and it was okay for Gertrude out. to be playing around. Uh, he doesn't think it's okay at all, but he's more angry with his brother, really. And, uh, but, yes, he, he would be hard on Gertrude. He says so. So the king, uh, the king does all he can do in that situation and uh, uh, thinks he's gotten away with it. That's the, this is, my, my, my novel is the romance that precedes yeah. the tragedy, which of course is a big tragedy with almost everybody in it dead at the end. Now there are those who will say, you know, they say a lot about this. When you, when you John Updike, tackle this, they're saying he's taking Shakespeare's characters and he's putting them in his own context. That's what he's doing here. Right, making a suburban couple. Exactly. One more suburban one couple. More, and you've read the review. Claudia. One more <laughs> suburban couple. <laughs> well, we Except all, that the New York Times liked it. Uh, they liked it, by and large, insofar yeah. as that, that woman, the reviewer, likes anything. Uh, I think she was relatively <laughs> gentle with this book, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful for all gentleness. I see this as a story of many levels. There is the lost version, lost in the mists of right. time. There is the Latin version, the French version, the Shakespeare's version, and now there's sort of my version. I see nothing wrong with my adding, adding one more layer to the, to the legend, to the Hamlet legend. Well, I would think that everybody would be interested in this kind of thing because, A, it's, it's much more interesting to read, I suspect, than, than just one more appraisal of Hamlet or one more analysis of Hamlet. And so we go into your mind to see how you talk about how you speculate on Claudius' motive and all these other things. I mean, he must make some decisions you're right, right. when you write a novel. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I didn't realize quite, quite, quite how many, but yes, you do have to sort of become a critic in a way. Yeah, and, and was, that diff was this difficult for you or was this relatively easy? It has its own joys, but it went slowly. I had to do some research, and then I had to feel my What's way wrong carefully. With research? That's good. It's, it's all right, but it takes time, and I'm yeah. a kind of impatient, jittery man who's running out of birthdays. But yes, I did the I did what what research I could, and uh, then I sat to write it carefully because when you're in the same ring as Shakespeare, I mean, it's Hamlet, Hemingway would have said, same arena as Shakespeare. You want to write well, as well as you can, in your kind of 20th century. Whoops, 21st century 21st prose. Century, yes. Now, did, did this idea actually come when you were watching? I mean, the idea came when you were watching Hamlet, Kenneth Branagh's Hamlet? The idea that I should go ahead and do it instead yeah. of just thinking about it. Also, I've always wanted to write a novel with the word and in the title. Other people have. This is the best way to do this that. Is, this is my <laughs> and, and novel. Yeah, now let me just talk about the dedication for a second. It's, it's obviously to your wife, Martha. And, and tell me what it says. Oh, I never thought you'd ask that. Wait a minute, I don't even yeah. have a book. I have the wrong book. It's in Provençal, and yeah. uh, one, of the, one of the inventions of this text is that Claudius is a great reader of Provençal poetry right. and right. his whole idea of romantic love and love in general. And I think it says roughly that uh, of desire my heart uh, knows no end, has no end uh, for uh, the one uh, whom um, uh, I love best. Okay, Very nice. that's for romantic. And I thought it was nicer just to leave it in the Provençal. Than, Except no one will be able to read. That's all right. <laughs> Any book should have its little mysteries, and that's this book's little mystery. Except now, again, I've given that yeah. away, too. Uh, but, yeah. uh, 
Is, is this play your favorite Shakespearean play? Uh, no, I think I really prefer As You Like It and the comedies and, of course, the tragedy Why? of King Lear is, in a way, a more coherent work. Well, As You Like It has Shakespeare at his lightest and funniest and everything fits and there's a lovely Rosalind yeah. in it and it has some beautiful lines and, I don't know, it's just more perfect. Hamlet has many virtues, but it's not perfect. It's, it's kind of untidy and you feel that Shakespeare was writing exceptionally well to get around the fact that this is really a pretty barbaric, strange plot. He had to delay it. I mean, in the old days, the real Viking prince would have just acted immediately on the ghost's word. But here he has a semi-modern man who's postponing it and wondering and setting tests and, you know, all this. And so uh, I feel it's beautifully written, obviously. Uh, Shakespeare rarely writes other than beautifully, but that is a play, it doesn't, it doesn't terribly measure up. T.S. Eliot said that uh, Shakespeare, the Hubble, it's, it's a failure. He said Hamlet is a failure because it's about an emotion uh, for which Shakespeare was not able to find the objective correlative. In other words, there's a disgust running through Hamlet's speeches that isn't really accounted for by anything within the, within the action. The words are greater than, than the action that supports them. Uh, but, uh, well, you answer my favorite. Yeah, and as to the tragedies, uh, it's not as tidy and as swift as Macbeth, and it's not as desolating as, as King, King Lear. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, I also prefer The Tempest, if one can make these silly, yeah. invidious remarks. It's marvelous, because Shakespeare is consistently marvelous, even when he's not mm. quite up How to you his... explain Shakespeare? It was a happy moment in the language and in the culture, in the English culture. Uh, writing plays was, was a growth art, a little like TV now or TV <laughs> 20 years ago. There was a demand for it, and I think that's always exciting for an artist. But that doesn't explain genius, does it? I mean, no, opportunity. no, but there, these, there was a ferment, let's say. There were lesser Shakespeare's, and along came this young man from Stratford who who entered in, and he was relaxed enough and yet ambitious enough to seize the moment. Uh, I don't think he realized how good he was. I, mean, I don't think he realized that 300 years later we'd all be you know, bowing our heads to Shakespeare, but uh, he seized the moment in the language and the culture and wrote these uh, amazing plays. An artist needs more than just his own strength. You need the strength of the culture with you, and there's a lot of sort of common wisdom. One of the nice things about Shakespeare is that he's a pop artist, yes? You feel he's a crowd pleaser. Yeah. <laughs> he'll do almost anything to get a laugh, all these parts. He'll do anything to please the company. He's a pro. Yeah. And yet with all and this, he's, in he's it for also the money. in it for the money. Yes, which he yeah, liked. He I liked know. money and bought houses back in Stratford. But uh, So all these professional, lowly, modest holidays were combined with an incomparable verbal flair, which the language made in part possible. It was just more fluid. I mean, you can't do adjectives and nouns ba ba backwards now without looking sort of silly. Uh, people would resist it, but Shakespeare was able to you know, mold that language any, any way he wanted. Do you mean, that does, do you think that uh, 300 years from now we'll look at somebody who's a contemporary of ours and say that was a rare genius? One wonders, then, then the second uh, question is who? <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Very hard to pick your own geniuses, although I think Shakespeare's exceptional quality was recognized fairly early. At, at contemporary Maybe times. Contemporary Ben Johnson yeah, had many right, nice things to say about him, and the other players cared enough to put together the plays in a book. So he had, but the extent to which he would tower over all other writers in English, I don't think could have been judged by anybody. It's hard for me to believe there's a contemporary or even a recently dead contemporary who would do that, but what do I know, really? Uh, Hemingway and Faulkner uh, still seem to be uh, our giants, uh, recent, our recent giants. Yeah. Very different of, of the 20th century, yeah. they were the giants. Yeah, somehow. In that, they did something uh, up brown, uh, and they each had such a voice, such a strong voice. I guess that's what, what we like about authors sometimes, is a voice. Yeah. Well, you've had, had that. A, I've tried to have a voice, yeah. but it's... It's very hard to will yourself to have a voice. You just have to try to find your material, material that excites you, and then say it. And in saying it, maybe you'll locate your, your voice. Knit. Who's the first person that reads your work? My good wife, uh, Martha. Martha. Looks, she has a first look. 
she does. But I don't, I don't ask her to read it till I'm kind of done with it. I don't want to confuse myself or her by showing her a half-finished work. So she doesn't really read it until I've completed, uh, I've gone through the handwritten draft and done the first written The types, first draft is the handwritten. First input the first input. The first draft is handwritten. Generally. It was in this case, yes. It, it, why in this case? Any particular reason in this oh, case? Oh, because it was tricky and because you can, you're a little closer to the paper and a little easier to express yourself if you're just writing, I find, uh, to get that extra inch closer to the characters. <laughs> to hear them breathe, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Do you hear them breathe? Uh, you hope to. You think yeah. you're hearing them breathe. Yeah, you may you be kidding yourself and you're not hearing, you're just hearing yourself breathe. But that is the hope to get to hear to them get breathe. Close. And then, uh, yeah, she reads it and then uh, she often has some things, the ty typos or even shrewder. How about character? Uh, not very drastic revisions generally, but some thoughts, which I then try to respond to in the final draft, which I send down to my editor, a woman called Judith Jones, who becomes the second reader. And after that, it's kind of catch as catch can, and I begin slowly to wander away, although I do attend to the proofs carefully, because that's another chance to make it a better, a better piece. How about the criticisms? Once well, the book by is that out. time, thank heavens, uh, the book is pretty well set in concrete, and although a critic who points out a factual error, you can sometimes adjust the error in later printings. By and large, you can't really do anything about their more major uh, faults that they find. So you are stuck with the book that you designed to the best of your ability. Maybe when you do the next one, some of those old criticisms sit in your mind, but in a way you hope not. You shouldn't try to write to please the critics because some of them there's, a, there's no pleasing, really. And you're in danger of giving away the whole ball game in the hopes of pleasing a, a phantom. The New Yorker recently celebrated its what, 75th. 75th anniversary. Uh, we had a group of them here. Uh, David was here and, and um, Roger was here and, and others. Uh, what's a New Yorker meant to you? It's meant an awful lot, maybe, maybe more than it's healthy, but as a boy, I, <laughs> as a boy, I adored it. Uh, I came into the house when I was 11 or 12, and I began to read it. First looked at the cartoons, and then I began to read the poetry. There was a lot more light verse then, and then some of the fiction even. I just liked the feel of it, the look of it, the understatedness of it. It wasn't like any magazine, other, any other magazine in my experience. It wasn't like the, the Post or Collier's or the National Geographic. Uh, so I wanted to be in that wonderful heaven of, of cool. I thought of it as cool. It was a cool magazine. And I was fortunate enough, uh, shortly after I graduated from college, to actually get a few things taken, a poem and then a story. Then I got a job. Then uh, I decided that to live in New York just took too much out of me. And I moved to New England. And there I've stayed, being a freelance writer. But throughout my freelance Lancedness um, was possible only because I felt the New Yorker was liked me and it did take a lot of things. So I can't imagine my literary life, in short, without the New, the New Yorker magazine. And, and it would be a sad thing if it were to vanish. It has changed enough so that even that's kind of sad. Uh, no longer takes the amount of fiction it used to. Uh, but uh, it was very kind to me and... Uh, until the novels began to make a little money, uh, I really was very dependent on it. If you didn't go to the New Yorker for fiction, where would you go? Well, that's it. Playboy, The Atlantic Monthly, Harper's. There are a number of magazines that still run it, but, but, it, but in nothing, and pay, pay good money yeah. uh, for it, but in nothing like the quantity you need to uh, support yourself. It's a, a GQ. Prince Fiction. There are, GQ, you know, Prince Fiction? Yes, did you know that? No, in fact, it has a very distinguished fiction writer as the fiction editor, Thomas Mallon, yeah. an excellent writer himself. Was but all, the, all these monthlies, you know, they print one story a month, uh, so they really can't uh, feed. Whereas The New Yorker in its prime really did support a number of short story writers. Cheever, F Frank O'Connor, there were just, a, a, so Sylvia Townsend Warner, they ran enough stories and paid enough relative to uh, people's financial needs in that era that you could, you could live as a short story writer for The New Yorker. Do you have a favorite editor? Uh, they've been, all been nice to me. I haven't had so many. William Maxwell, himself a writer, and now in his 90s, was immensely gentle and wise. <laughs> to me, Roger Angel, whom you had here, uh, Roger also 
more, more my generation, but still an older figure. Uh, they give you, uh, you know, feedback, but not uh, too much. You know Roger's mother? I knew Catherine White. Indeed, I did. <laughs> she was my first editor, in fact. And, and she was also kind to me. Uh, she was going off to Maine about the time I came to live in New York. But uh, she was my first editor and a very formidable, but not just formidable. She also had a very sweet side. What the New Yorker editors made you feel was that, that they were grateful. They were grateful for what they considered good stuff. And this kind of warmth isn't found in every magazine or every pu pu publication If venue. you put together the, the New Yorker family, it is a remarkable sh exhibition of American literary talent. I think they had most of the best. Yeah. There were some talents they never ran. Yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, some people they didn't get. That's right. No. No, obviously they didn't. But they weren't trying to. Ross in the beginning didn't have much money, and he was trying to bring up young talents, and he did. He did bring up a whole generation of really wonderful writers. And what do you uh, think about all these books like Renata Adler and all uh, that? Well, I've read them, um, <laughs> most of them. You read everything. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't really read enough. But I, have, I do have this morbid, this old, sentimental <laughs> attachment to The New Yorker that led me to read Renata's book with a good deal of interest. She says many things that are uh, true enough. Uh, there is something a little uh, harsh and strange, I thought, about the, the overall take on the magazine. Uh, but it's uh, odd that it still generates passion. I can't think of any other magazine. Well, they're arguing about it all the time. Yeah, they're <laughs> arguing about right. it. And their relationship the good old with days Sean, are... And also Sean as a central figure, as a mysterious and apparently very attractive figure to, to females at least very kind to me and very important in my literary life, but I hadn't thought him as this, this love object until, until recently. Did you not know? You didn't know. <laughs> uh, you didn't know, huh? Uh, I knew, but it, I didn't know. I, I didn't know. You knew, but you how didn't much. know? I didn't know, you know how, how much. much. <laughs> I didn't know how real. I thought I might have been imagining it, actually. <laughs> My fevered imagination. Uh, speaking of women, is this your best female character, you think? <laughs> well, I'd hate to say so, but I worked hard with her and liked being well, in, I mean, she is one in of your her favorites, company. Then? I mean, one, of my, one of my favorites. Really? Is that say. fair to say? Sure. Is it? But I like, I'm not putting I, words in your no, mouth. No, one of my favorites. Well, that's all right. You can put them in. Who but you could put words in? Um, yeah. <laughs> no, she's, she's, yeah. Fi uh, she's fine. She's fine. Yeah. I like her. I like her, especially when she was young and kind of freckled. I think I had her freckled at one point. I may have taken that out. Yeah. But when she's young and plump and innocent and sweet and yet also kind of sharp and right. she knows her mind. But I've had other female characters that I at least liked. Um, those three witches in yeah. Witches of Eastwick, I thought they were all... Now, some people criticize so those. Come on. I they mean, did, they do. I know. But they really I beat up on why. you. I don't know why. <laughs> to me, they're created in love. They're <laughs> lovable women. Yeah. Lovingly written about, and the, the w w women in couples also. Uh, I, I spent a long time with them because that was a long book, and I became very fond of Foxy and Angela and, yeah. the, and the others. So I'm not aware of being a misogynist or a monster, but... Uh, and when you read I, that? When I read that I am, I say, who, me? <laughs> uh, no, it I'm, just... I mean, you know it's not so, therefore you, it shouldn't... Or you wonder how... I'm not, not that they've said... I don't know that anybody said that you're a misogynist, but perhaps oh, yes, they have. They have said that. And I ask myself, can this be true? And maybe there's some level at which it is true, true of me and a lot of other American men. But then I try to deal with that. And maybe in writing this book, I was especially conscious of trying to make, make G Gertrude live. Make Gertrude live. So I'm on to something. Yeah, you're on to something. But when, when aren't you on to something? Uh, <laughs> but again, making of criticism, you, don't, don't, you can't take it very seriously, but you should give it, pay it some heed. Mm -hmm. These are intelligent people, after all. Now, let me just, before you go, do you, is this, this, this Shakespeare, look at this. you got all these little well, things. Well, I was thinking, yes, I kind of marked her speeches, well, also, basically. Oh, God, look at this. This is Gertrude to Ophelia, is that what that is? Yeah, yeah I, mean. I think one of my favorite scenes in my own novel, if I can talk about that, is yeah. when she does talk to Ophelia and yeah. tries to figure out if Ophelia and Hamlet are sleeping together. And uh, the impression of Ophelia is very lovely, but also kind of slightly wacky or loose in the head already. That is, yeah. it wasn't just the misfortunes with Hamlet that drove Ophelia mad, but that she had a streak of craziness in her. Anyway, I worked hard at that scene. Two women talking together. 
what do I know really what women say when they're alone, but I tried to imagine yeah. it, and I was pleased with the Result. results. All right. Uh, it's great to have you here, as always. You're most kind. <laughs> Gertrude and Claudia is a novel by John Updike. We'll be right back. Stay with us.